Please open to Romans 6 in your Bibles. I ask you to bear with me as I'm struggling with a cold. I uh, encourage you to pray for me. Romans 6, we continue our verse by verse series through the book of Romans. We're in the heart of chapter 6 through 8, which has the theme of sanctification. And we focus on the next text in chapter 6, Romans 6. Follow along as I read verses 17 and 18. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. And then, reading again from the Amplified Version, But thank God, though you were once slaves of sin, you have become obedient with all your heart to the standard of teaching in which you were instructed and to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, you have become the servants of righteousness, of conformity to the divine will in thought, purpose, and action. On July 31st, 1838, on the island of Jamaica, 10,000 slaves gathered for a great praise gathering. They were celebrating the new Emancipation Proclamation Act that would abolish slavery on the island, and they built a huge coffin and placed in it whips, branding irons, chains, fetters, slave garments, and all the things that represented the terrible slavery system that was now coming to an end in Jamaica. At the first stroke of the midnight bell, someone shouted, the monster is dying. At each stroke of the bell after that, this cry was repeated and the great crowd began to join in the cry. At the twelfth stroke, 10,000 voices cried out together, the monster is dead, the monster is dead. Let us bury him. They then nailed the coffin lid shut and lowered it into a huge grave and covered it up. That night, every heart rejoiced and 10,000 voices grew hoarse from shouting and crying with joy. Once they were in bondage to slavery, but now they were free. I certainly can understand their rejoicing. But in a very real sense, when a person becomes a Christian, he or she should experience even greater joy and elation because spiritual slavery to sin is a much harsher tyrant and taskmaster than any human one. In this message, I want to emphasize the importance of freedom and liberty we have from sin through our Lord Jesus Christ and the joy and the actual Freedom we should be experiencing from this liberty. So then, if you look at your text in verse 17a, we look at point number one, no longer slaves. And that's what our text says. But it begins with the phrase, but God be thanked. The Apostle Paul thanks God for delivering believers from slavery to sin and for the privilege of being servants of righteousness. That those are things something or those are things worthy of our thanks, are they not? Thanking God reminds the believers that they don't owe their deliverance to their own choice of God or by their own merit or works were they saved but they were delivered from the bondage of sin by the grace and mercy of God. And so as slaves in the past, before their conversion, the believers tried everything in the world to break the power of sin to no avail, and only divine power could free them, and so we must give credit where credit is due. Thank God for this freedom we have. But the focus of thanksgiving here is not so much on the fact that they were formerly slaves as sin. It is that, but the focus is more on the fact of their liberation that came afterwards. 
And this is what we as Christians are seeking always to nail down, to experience more and more in our battle against sin, is liberation, liberation, victory, victory, freedom, freedom. This is what Galatians 6 is talking about. That believers should be in a positive realm of freedom from the slavery of sin. And therefore, our cause and grounds for rejoicing and thanksgiving should be frequent. Should be as often as we freshly experience victory and freedom over sin. You see, without the grace of God, the whole human race is held captive under the dominion of sin. But the reign of the kingdom of sin comes to an end for the person as, uh, or a person as soon as the gift of saving grace is granted to him or her by faith in Jesus Christ. This is important because this deliberate comparison in our text between the slaves of sin and slaves of righteousness magnifies the grace of God in liberating us as slaves of sin. What a tremendous motivation deliverance from sin is to the praise and thanksgiving of God. We should experience something of the lightness and the freedom and the joy of this deliverance when we conclude our private time prayers and we sense a fresh, the fresh grace of cleansing and renewal, the burden of sin, the guilt of sin, the weight of sin being lifted from our shoulders. This should issue forth in fresh thanksgiving to God. And so this ongoing experience of Renewed liberation is an ongoing cause for thanksgiving to God in the life of a Christian. For example, can you imagine the joy the slaves felt during the U.S. Civil War after hearing the Emancipation Proclamation? From, what, North Carolina all the way through Texas or wherever the South is conformed to on the map? A shout of praise and thanksgiving to God for that freedom. Even further, can you imagine how the Israelites felt when Moses and Aaron told them that their 430-year tenure as slaves in Egypt was over? And that very day, the entire nation would journey out into the desert as a free people. And isn't that, a, that given to us of the Jews' emancipation as slaves in Egypt isn't that given to us as a metaphor and type of our freedom from the bondage to sin? How much more then should we thank and praise God for ending our spiritual captivity to sin through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross? And that's why as believers, after our conversion, our attention and our focus goes deeper, is fixed deeper on the cross. Not only do we experience an initial break from captivity with sin and the freedom thereof, but ongoing freedom, and therefore this freedom continues in our lives through faith in Jesus Christ who died not only to make us free, but to keep us free. And this is what the Apostle um, John sees on a grand scale in his vision of all heaven and earth praising and thanking the Lamb who was slain to redeem sinners by releasing them from the prison house of sin. The picture in Revelation 5, turn there quickly, Revelation 5, verses 8 and following. The picture there is on all of intelligent creation, including angels and seraphim, the spirits of just men made perfect, 24 elders, Four creatures that are difficult to describe what they look like. All falling down and worshiping and thanking the Lamb. Why? Because He was slain. And why was He slain? To release us from the bondage and captivity of sin. So that in the future, when you and I join that innumerable company of the saints in heaven, forever and ever praising and thanking the Lamb who was slain for us, 
What will be driving our prayers is the fact that the Lamb shed His blood and was slain not only to forgive us of sin, but to give us ongoing freedom and liberty, even everlasting freedom from the bondage of sin. Verse 8, Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Redeemed us from what? From the power and penalty and dominion of sin. Look at verse 11. Then I looked... And I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy of the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. In our communion with God, we are reminded by the Holy Ghost of God that the Lamb of God... And uh, has slain his blood to not only forgive and purge us from sin's penalty and guilt, but to provide ongoing triumph over sin to our Lord Jesus Christ. For we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. That's not some nice theological notion floating around out there in spiritual never-never land. This is a reality for those who know the Lord Jesus Christ and, and the, the, the shackle-destroying freedom we're given from the bondage to sin. And sometimes in our quiet time or even in public worship, the Holy Spirit brings to our remembrance the glory of God's grace in delivering us as slaves from sin. And, and, and we can't help but thank Him and, and this is grounds for great praise and thanksgiving to God as David praised him. King David in 1 Chronicles 29.10 who said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel. It's praise like this that we bring to God at the remembrance of the freedom we have from sin slavery. Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. Your hand, in your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. It's this kind of response of thanks and praise, maybe in different ways from First Chronicles to Revelation, different forms of thanks, but nevertheless, the spirit of adoption within us must cry, must cry with thanksgiving to God, or the stones will cry out. Praise and thanksgiving to God. But continuing on in verse 17, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, he's telling us that we are not slaves of sin. We are not slaves of sin. I know it's hard to remember that sometimes because the battle against sin sometimes is so fierce and furious and discouraging. But the text says you were, past tense, slaves of sin, does it not? That means right now you're not what? Slaves, slaves of sin. sin. A basic understanding of grammar will help us realize that we are not right now as Christians slaves of sin. I am not a slave of sin. Say that. I am, I am not, not a slave, slave of sin. sin. What was the last time you thought that? 
Sometimes we get so caught up in this battle against remaining corruption. We forget we were redeemed no longer to be a slave of sin, but a slave of righteousness. We must change our thinking. Not based on some wishful thinking, but based on what the text says. You were slaves of sin. You're not slaves any longer. Up to sin, that is. And that brings me to my second point, number two. Obedience from the heart. Verse 17b, look at the next phrase. Yet, you obeyed from the heart. <coughs> Slaves don't obey from the heart. They obey because of the whip at their back. But now that we're slaves of righteousness, our obedience is rooted in a different motivation, is it not? We obey from the heart. Now there's a different kinds of obedience. Every day, you obey laws, civil laws, you obey commands that people give you. There's different reasons for our obedience. We obey sometimes because we're forced to obey. You see the speed limit sign, 65 miles an hour. You're afraid that you'll get a ticket. So as that needle creeps up to 80 and beyond, the fear of God comes upon you and you're forced to let up on the accelerator a little bit because you don't want a ticket. You're obeying because you're forced to obey. If that sign wasn't there, that needle would keep on going. It doesn't matter how dangerous you're driving. You're, gonna, you're not forced to obey, but some people obey because they're forced to or by way of constraint. Others obey out of duty, a sense of duty. I have to. I'm used to doing this. It's part of my routine. I've got to do it. It's my duty. Got to go to work. Got to provide for the fam family. I'm a breadwinner. It's my duty. Got to obey what my boss says. It's my duty or I don't get that paycheck. Got to take out my, the garbage. It's my duty or the house will stink. Also, some obey from the heart. There's a willingness there. I obey because I want to, not because I have to, but because I want to. And the other reason is we obey from love. So four kinds here, by force, out of duty, from the heart, and from love. Which category do you fall into when it comes to the things of God, when it comes to your battle with sin? You see, when it comes to obedience, motive is everything to God. Why do we obey? What is our motive? An unsaved person's motive, sadly, is almost always out of fear, or self-interest, or by constraint, and not from the heart, not out of love. One of the first signs of a true conversion is when a person obeys God from the heart, because nothing but the saving power of God can transform a person from the love of sin to the love of holiness. Who loves holiness? The only reason why you and I love holiness is because God put it in our hearts to love Him and His holiness. <clears throat> Unsaved souls are constantly influenced by sin to obey evil. But when converted... We're under a constant influence, are we not, to obey God. So you have a choice. And heart obedience is the mark of the new creation, as opposed to legal obedience by constraint, which turns all spiritual activities, such as worship and prayer and repentance and communion with God, into a drudgery and a heaviness. Legal obedience causes the things of God to be painful and a drudgery when you attempt to engage in such activities. But obeying from love when God commands you to come and worship and willingly from the heart causes you to enjoy prayer and worship. We learn then from this phrase in our text, obey from the heart, that there's a tremendous contrast between the external letter of the law with the hidden power of the Holy Spirit. God is teaching here 
that heart love for Christ inwardly equips us better to worship and serve the Lord than the law ever can by threatening and terrifying us. Let me say that again. When you obey from the heart, when heart love for Christ is felt, that equips us better to worship and serve the law, Lord than the law can by threatening and terrifying us. And that's what Romans said in chapter 2, verse 8. Those who are self-seeking do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. But we obey the Lord because we delight to obey Him. We love to obey Him. We find joy in his righteous in fulfilling his righteous requirements. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. His people obey him. Perfectly, no, but we obey him. And when we do obey him, we should obey him because we love him and we want to obey him. We're willing to obey him. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, You've purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren. Love one another fervently with a pure heart. You see what can be accomplished when God commands us to do things that we are not naturally equipped to do? We're able with this purification, this purified soul to obey the truth through the Spirit, by the power of the Spirit, we're able to sincerely love the brethren and love one another with a pure heart. Moving on in the text, it says, you obey from the heart. So we need to obey from the heart. That form of doctrine to which you were delivered. We're to obey the form of doctrine. The word form here literally in the original means the type of doctrine, the pattern of doctrine, the rule of doctrine that we find in the scripture, the unchangeable, immutable doctrines of the Bible. We obey them from the heart. We obey the gospel with the correct motive. Now, doctrine or the gospel is like a mold when it says form here. It's describing something like a mold that one pours molten metal into. Once the metal hardens that you poured into the mold, once it hardens, it becomes permanent and can't be changed. When you and I become saved, we are poured into the mold of the Bible and we're shaped by the doctrine of the Bible, which becomes permanently fixed in us by conviction to the truth. So the mold of our hearts and the mold of our minds and the mold of our understanding of doctrine is shaped by the scripture. And conviction to that truth, to that scripture, hardens this mold so it cannot be changed easily. Now the Jewish rabbis did just the opposite. Over the last 2,000 years, they altered the Bible to fit the culture they lived in and made a book out of it called the Talmud. But the true Christian conforms to the Bible. We don't have the Bible conform to our lifestyle. This isn't situational ethics. The Christian conforms to the doctrine, not the doctrine to the whim of the Christian. And the doctrine is the mold that gives everything else its meaning. And so we obey from the heart that form of doctrine, that type of doctrine that has been fixed in us by way of conviction to the truth, fixed in hearts and minds and spirits that cannot easily be changed because it's a permanent mold. It's a permanent mold. And in the last days, the church of Jesus Christ, the institutional body of believers, is going to be in such a, a, a precarious, dangerous 
condition in its relationship to doctrine. That the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now, when you obey from the heart that doctrine, you are saying, look, I love this truth. It's not only a matter of conviction mentally, intellectually, to the truth. It's a matter of me loving this truth. And when you love the truth, you're like a mold that cannot be melted down and changed. That's why we're told in 2 Timothy 1, hold fast the pattern of sound words. Hold fast the mold, the permanent mold that you have been made into in terms of your understanding of truth, your conviction to the truth, and your love of that truth. Hold that pattern of sound doctrine and your love for that doctrine which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Hold fast that love of the truth. Hold fast that conviction of the truth. So that when we worship, we don't just concur intellectually under the preaching of the truth that it's right and it's true. Our hearts leap for joy. Our hearts relish in that truth. We love it. It feeds me. It changes me. But whenever a sinner receives the gospel with the right motive, he receives it with his whole heart. Under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, when an unconverted person hears the gospel and God calls him effectually by the drawing power of his spirit, the Holy Spirit melts the heart of that unconverted person so that he receives the gospel with his whole heart. In other words, he makes no excuses for his sin. He doesn't pick and choose the doctrine. He receives all of the doctrines of the scripture. He doesn't make excuses for his sin. He doesn't complain that God's commandments are burdensome. He doesn't reject any doctrine because it's too humbling. Under the heart melting, soul drawing power of the Holy Spirit, the sinner embraces every doctrine happily. However painful it is to his flesh, however humbling it is, to him, He embraces this doctrine happily because he knows it's the truth and his heart responds with obedience and love and faith to the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that heart response of obedience and love after conversion continues in the true believer who obeys from the heart the teaching of the Bible. God's concerned about your attitude and motive in obeying. It's not about what you can get out of it or if it's convenient for you. You should be obeying from the heart without question the word of God. You should say, yes, Lord. And yes, Lord, I delight to do thy will. I delight. I agree with the law of God after the inward man. I delight in it. In the law of God after the inward man. And so the true believer obeys from the heart the teaching of the Bible, which shapes our life. It's not an irksome thing. We're not reluctant, but we're cheerful, sincere, and willing in spirit to obey God's doctrines on His terms. That's why the scripture says, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. He makes us willing in the day of His power when His Spirit slays us with repentance and we're no longer making exceptions or asking God, just give me another more month in this lifestyle. When the Holy Spirit grants us repentance, we are slain before Him and He's free to write anything He wants on the blackboard of our hearts, which has been freshly erased through repentance. And we say amen to everything He writes on that blackboard. Therefore, how can someone who has had this attitude of obeying God from the heart willingly, based on firm conviction of the truth, cast off sound doctrine and live like an unconverted person who drinks water like iniquity? 
because the text says that the true Christian, look at the end of verse 17, has been delivered. To which we have been what? Delivered. We've been delivered from legal obedience. We've been delivered from a works kind of righteousness. We've been transferred from one master to another. We have freedom to obey. We have a new master. And the Holy Spirit gives us grace to obey this new master willingly from the heart because we love him. And there's no way we can return to our former master, sin, because we loathe him now. He's our greatest enemy now. Our eyes are open to his schemes and devices and deceptions to drag us down all our, all our lives and keep us in his slavery service. The sword, realizing that the source of most, if not all, of our problems has been because of our sin. And it is constantly, our sin is constantly threatening to ruin our souls. We need this freedom to live for Christ and not be ruined and ashamed and embarrassed and, and threatened. We're not slaves of sin. We need to tap into the power of Jesus Christ, which is given to us freely to live as liberated, conquering, triumphing saints over sin. But thirdly, we learn that we're slaves of righteousness. We're slaves of righteousness. Verse 18. And having been set free from sin. The word free here does not refer to justification as it does in verse 7. Which reads, he who has died has been freed from sin. He's justified. His sins are forgiven. His sin is not, he's not held accountable. He's acquitted. But here in verse 18, the word free in the original is different. It refers to the Christian's freedom from the ongoing dominion of sin, which the believer is promised in verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. This is a promise of God. Sin shall not have dominion over you. You are free. To obey, you are free to say no to sin and yes to God. And yes to obey God. In obedience to Him rather. It refers to the freedom of slaves from their masters. Before salvation. A person is a slave of sin, but now he has been freed by the gospel. And so this means, having been set free from sin, that we've already, already, having been, having been set free. We have already been transferred from one possession, from the possession of an old master to a new master. You have a new master. When the old master speaks to you and says, do this, do that, you are given liberty and power to say no. No, no, a thousand times no to the old master. Because the new master provides the strength to resist sin's hold on us. Though it's a constant battle, yes. He provides you the freedom to resist the clutches of sin, which every day, through temptation of thought, word, and deed, are reaching out at you, saying, enjoy my pleasures as you once did. However, being set free from sin means, it doesn't mean, rather, that we are perfect or we stop committing acts of sin. We still commit acts of sin, but we are not a slave of sin any longer. We, we do not practice sin any longer. We are free. We are not free from the influence of sin, but we no longer practice sin by the soul free power of Jesus Christ. We are free from sin as the dominating control power in my life. And in the next phrase, he says, you have become slaves of righteousness. The freedom from sin brings a new slavery. In verse 20, we're shown what a tragic, what a tragic life we experienced when we were slaves of sin. But here, we are shown what a glorious liberty we obtained 
as slaves of righteousness. And slaves of righteousness are believers who are obedient to righteousness. To be a slave means you have to obey what your master says. And your new master, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has made you a slave of righteousness, has given you grace to obey him and to love that righteousness and to have joy in obeying him. And so, as a slave of righteousness, we are shown what a glorious liberty it is. And so, the slaves of righteousness are believers who are obedient to righteousness and are devoted to a lifestyle of practicing righteousness. Or as verse 22 says, we are slaves of God. And we are devoted as servants of righteousness to a lifestyle of practicing that righteousness. The meaning of this phrase, slaves of righteousness, is that the Christian is completely devoted to God as a slave is to his master. Are you completely devoted to God as a slave of righteousness as you formerly were in your past life devoted as a slave of sin to your old master? Every time sin called, you were there with zeal, with enthusiasm. You were competing with others to be the best sinner you can at the sin that you, you performed or did, right? Yeah. You would argue with people, oh, I, I'm, I can be better at that vanity and that futility and that vexation of heart and life and that stupidity and that wickedness. But now that we're slaves of righteousness and have been made free, are we passive and are we lackadaisical? Are we without enthusiasm and inspiration and zeal and excitement when it comes to devoting and dedicating and surrendering ourselves fully as slaves of righteousness as slaves of God, we should be more zealous in pursuing righteousness and holiness than unbelievers are in pursuing vanity. You say, well, how zealous are they? Well, tune in to the Super Bowl two weeks from now and see how zealous people are in, in pursuing vanity. We should be twice as zealous People leave the Super Bowl with laryngitis. They're so hoarse from, from screaming and shouting for their favorite team, right? Oh, that the Holy Spirit would, would melt our hearts with zeal for the house of God and the righteousness of Christ going out with the gospel. We're free. We don't have to be bogged down and held down in the mire and quicksand of sin so that we never have time or strength or heart or desire to serve righteousness because our conscience is always convicting us as hypocrites. We are free. I am free to say no to sin so I can get on in serving God in righteousness and have my life ushered into the kingdom of God abundantly through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The former relationship as a slave of sin was negative. This new relationship is positive. As we see in this term, you became servants of righteousness. You are a servant of righteousness. Say, I am a servant of righteousness. I am a servant of righteousness. Say it again. I am a servant of righteousness. I know this isn't a kindergarten class where we all have to repeat our ABCs, but sometimes we don't even think that one time in our battle against iniquity. We need to plant our feet in the sand and say no to sin and say, I am a servant of righteousness. This isn't coming from some word of faith preacher, some televangelist who was, who was just repeating some mantra and is trying to make you some kind of cosmic theological zombies. Just repeat this and you'll become, you'll speak into existence. What I say, nonsense. 
Nonsense. This is what the scripture says. You and I as believers are servants of righteousness. And we need to get that truth deep down into our hearts, minds, and souls. And we need to lay hold of the promise embedded in this truth that brings to me the grace and power of Jesus Christ that enables me to keep my feet planted in the, on the rock, even Jesus Christ, when that sin gives off its siren call. For me to obey it. My Lord Jesus Christ. And your Lord Jesus Christ. The almighty. Resurrected. Son of God. Has made me free. From hard bondage to sin. To be a servant. Of righteous, righteousness. Leading to holiness. This freedom leads to holiness. This Freedom, our freedom, leads to holiness. Paul says in the very next verse, in verse 19, I speak in Romans 6, 19, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for Holiness. And verse 22 says, which we'll get to in a week or two, but now having been set free from sin, he repeats it again. Past tense, we have been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, what's the result of this freedom? You have your fruit to holiness and the end of everlasting life. And so, I ask this question of each of you. Now that you're a servant of righteousness, how can we go back to our former lifestyle as slaves of sin? Now that we've reached this awesome, pinnacle, and highest calling as a servant and slave of righteousness, a slave of God, what an honor to lay my life, my mind, my intellect, my affections, my will, my all at the feet of Jesus, to have purity and righteousness and holiness emanate out through me to a world to shine the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ to a wicked dying world. What an honor and privilege of being a light of Jesus Christ and a servant of righteousness. How can I go back to being a slave of sin? Since I've, I've reached the highest calling, the highest fulfillment, the highest gratification or sense of, of achievement and accomplishment, spiritually speaking, that God has given to us as a gift and a purpose for our creation. How can I go back to being a slave of sin and wallow in the filth and muck and mire? of iniquity. How can I even think about entertaining and harboring sin in such a way where I'm both a slave of sin and a slave, a slave of righteousness? When the two are so diametrically opposed. You and I as human beings converted by the power of God have been created to be the very temple that <clears throat> contains the treasure of the presence of God himself. God is not in the angels. God is not in the animals. But God dwells within his people, he himself. So that we should no longer live the rest of our time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For haven't we spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries? Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. 
Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which yourselves once walked when you lived in them. It is so infinitely unworthy of a child of God who has God himself living inside of them, who has been given the supreme honor and privilege of being a slave of righteousness and a servant of the living God to go back and occupy our minds and our thoughts and our hearts and our affections with the filth and the wickedness of this world. We need to vomit out, vomit out all of that vileness and be renewed in the spirit of our mind and live the lifestyle that comes as a result of being under a new master. I am now a servant of righteousness. And as such, I am to occupy my mind and heart with the things which deepen holiness and righteousness. I am to be filled with the thoughts and the meditations of God and His Word, which will stimulate and quicken and enlarge righteousness and holiness in me. That we put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And that's why Paul begs. He begs by the Holy Spirit through him speaking to us, the church. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Because we were buried with Him at baptism, you said to God, you said to the angels, you said to your brethren who are in spirit form in heaven, you were saying to your brethren through all the whole earth, and even those unbelievers and saved that were at your baptism, I am dead, I am buried with Jesus Christ into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Yes, you're getting old. Yes, Pastor Owen has more gray hair. Yes, some of you ladies are doing your best to hide the crow's feet at the corner of your eyes. Your outward man is perishing. But when it comes to the weightier calling... That is our battle against sin and maintaining and even growing in a lifestyle of being a servant of righteousness. The inward man is being renewed day by day, day by day, and is becoming more useful and more pleasing to God by the day. So the meaning of this text in verses 17 and 18, that we are no longer slaves, that we are servants of righteousness, that we... Or we obey from the heart willingly. The meaning is as since we've already been made free from sin's dominion. It's unreasonable. It's unconscionable. That we should continue in a state of bondage to sin any longer. In other words, we should maintain the freedom we have. And not be brought again under the dominion of sin from which Christ has set us free. Why? Because we've been liberated to enter the kingdom of righteousness in my spirit. I am now, not when I die, I am right now in another kingdom. I am in the kingdom of righteousness. And I have at my disposal the unsearchable, the unfathomable power and grace of God that enables me to live in this kingdom of righteousness as a light shining in darkness. Amen. I just have to believe him for it every day. Trust him for it every day. Passive, a passive approach to faith will not do. If you expect to live by the power of God as a free son and daughter of Jesus Christ, faith is going to be in full operation, brother. Faith is going to be exercised your heart's going to go out to Christ and before you get the answer, you're going to believe you have it. Just like when you persevered in your prayers 
when you were an unconverted person asking the Lord Jesus to save you, you did not take no for an answer. You kept on believing until you received the promise. Therefore, in accordance with our new nature, it's natural that you turn away from sin. It's normal as a Christian that you strain and turn and fight violently away from sin as the rule and master of your life and occupy your minds completely with righteousness and the kingdom of righteousness that you have been transferred into when you became a Christian. God has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. That we should walk worthy of God who calls you into His own kingdom and glory. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let me close with two applications. Number one, do you obey only out of a sense of duty or by constraint or willingly from a heart of love? If most of your obedience is out of duty, just you obey because the flesh is just so used to doing it. It's the wrong motive, brother. It's still good to obey. Even if it's out of a sense of duty, it's still better to obey. Let me clarify that right now. Some of you have been thinking, well, shouldn't we still obey even when we don't feel like it? Yes, yes. Obey anyway. Obey anyway. But remember, when it says we are to obey from the heart, that form of doctrine, that the heart is the seat of all the affections and emotions and choices we make. Whatever has control of your heart has control of you. That's why the Bible says, keep your heart, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Whatever the condition of your heart, if it's predisposed to evil, if it's more inclined to righteousness, that's the direction you're going to go. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. So the condition of our hearts determine our attitude and our approach to obedience. And so when God says obey from the heart, the condition of your heart will determine whether or not you will obey him or disobey him. An unsaved person is dead and trespasses in sin. And does not love God because the Holy Spirit must supply this love as He sheds it abroad in our hearts. An unsaved person doesn't have the power to obey, even though because of guilt and other things, he knows he's wrong in disobeying. But the Christian knows God and His love. Therefore, the Christian, even more diligently than an unsaved person, a believer who knows how important it is to have his or her heart in the right spiritual frame should always be guarding and preparing our hearts to bring forth love and praise to God in everything. Especially in our walk, worship, and service to Him. It's very important that when we walk with God, we're not doing so with cold, dead hearts. In our personal devotions, our quiet time. We need to penetrate beneath the letter of the law, the surface of Scripture, until we meet through meditation and faith in the Holy Spirit to open up my eyes that I might behold wondrous things out of His law, that I meet the Savior and I begin fellowshipping with the living Word who is feeding the written Word and making it powerful and effectual and edifying in my heart. And our hearts are joyfully and fully engaged in communion. Same thing is true with worship. How, what state was your heart in when you came in this morning? Well, depending on what state it's in, except by the grace of the Holy Spirit, will depend on how much you're getting out of it. 
Those of you who are struggling to stay awake, what's going on with your heart, brother? <laughs> Out of the heart flow the issues of life. It's either that or you need to make sure you get a good eight hours of sleep the night before. One of the two. Amen. But also, to prepare your heart before you come to worship. Brother Carney and I, every once in a while, we, uh, we sharpen each other when we're in the house of the Lord. And we're always saying to each other, I, I just couldn't wait to get here. I, I can't wait to get here Sunday morning. So that my heart can pour forth praise to God. Now we praise God every day. But there's something special about corporate worship. As we join together collectively in worshiping the Lord. Where the presence of God is honoring His Word. Feeding His Word to His people. Glorifying His Word in us. Our hearts should be so prepared. That the moment we enter the house of God. We should expect to meet with God. We look forward to meet with God. And our hearts can't wait. It's like a... A horse being restrained with a bit in its mouth. We can't wait to pour forth praise and thanksgiving and glorify God in our hearts. And in our service to the Lord. There's nothing more miserable than watching a backslidden Christian trying to witness to somebody else or serve the Lord. The words are just so hard to get out. And there's so much leanness in our hearts. We, we have no treasure house of fresh manna from heaven to draw from. When we're trying to describe the indescribable. And we're just kind of miserable. And we quote a quick verse or two and get out of there as fast as we can. But when, but when the Spirit of God gives our hearts freedom and liberty... Because we've already dealt with the sin. We've already experienced that liberty that enables us to get to a place where we're serving Him in righteousness. With a clear conscience and clean hands and a pure heart. Oh, the torrent of thoughts about God and His kingdom are sometimes never ending that come out of us. And people think, he should stop drinking coffee. He's had too much caffeine today. <laughs> oh, the heart that is set free, that is let loose by the power of the Spirit in describing the glory of God and the, and the, the preciousness of Christ and His character and the majesty of the gospel and the splendor of the work of Christ on the cross. Oh, may He make all of our tongues like the pen of a ready writer, ready to pour forth praise and describing. Though straight to a breaking point with human language, the indescribable glories of heaven through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, enjoy your freedom, your liberty. Because... The Bible says in the second application, well, let me just say it. The second application is a question, rather. Do you believe and act upon the freedom you enjoy from sin through Christ's victory over sin and death? Do you believe and act upon the freedom you enjoy from sin through Christ's victory over sin and death? Do you believe that you are free? From the bondage to sin? Why do I have to ask that a second time? Because sometimes we act like we don't believe it. Or we haven't thought about it. Or we're so defeated and discouraged. That's as far as night and day from our thinking as you can get. Oh my brothers and my sisters. It is not about you and your thinking. It's about what Christ did. He said it is finished. He purchased our victory. The Lord Jesus Christ on the cross conquered not only Satan, not only the world, but he defeated and triumphed over sin. Even the remaining sin that is the troubler and tormentor of his people. He conquered. And so therefore we conquer in and through him. We conquer in and through him. So you've got to come to a place where you believe that on your behalf and in your place, vicariously, Jesus is your ongoing victory over the power of sin 
to bring you back under his control. And so in our text, in essence what God is saying is that at one time you gave yourself to sin as its slave. And when you did that, righteousness, righteousness had no claim over you. But now that you are the servant of God, as a slave of righteousness, sin has no claim over you. When sin knocks and says, can I come in? Sin has no claim. It has no right and no authority. However strong the strength of it is working in you in its lust, it still has no authority. The power of Christ is greater than the strength of sin working in you. You can say no, no. And look to Christ and remind Him with faith in Him that He died to sanctify you. He died to free you. He died to liberate you from the power and dominion and penalty of sin. And so we need to replace a defeatist attitude. Some of us are defeated before we even begin. Sin knocks on the door and we're, we're so knee-jerk reacting like it's not going to work again. We lost the battle. Oh, it's going to happen again. We're just like an observer watching sin build in its momentum in our heart leading to a fall. A passive observer. Get out of the bleachers. Get on the field. And do what God commands you to do. Trust in the Lord for the grace and strength to sanctify you. Remind the Lord in faith that He died to sanctify you so that sin no longer has dominion over you. And therefore you will find the strength of sin depleting and diminishing. What does our text mean? What does our text mean if it doesn't mean deliverance from ongoing sin? You tell me what it means. If it doesn't mean we have freedom and deliverance from the ongoing work of sin to control me and dominate me and bring me back into its bondage. What does it mean if it doesn't mean we have victory and freedom? For sin shall not have dominion over you. God says, if you're not under law but under grace. And so we need to believe what Jesus said. We need to believe, exercise faith in what Jesus said. What did he say? Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me what? Free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Remember, that's you attempting in your strength by works to keep sin under control. Remember, we, we don't live under that category of works or law keeping to keep a spiritual enemy like sin under control. No, no, we run out from under that category of law keeping or works real quick. We come under the cross and we are hidden under and in the cross. We are hidden. Our life is hidden with Christ in God. And so when the strength of sin comes knocking at my door, it's weak in the flesh, yes. The law or works or the strength of the flesh cannot defeat sin. Then I run and flee unto the cross and I look to Christ. And I say, Lord, you said the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. You said what the law couldn't do, God did. <laughs> what my attempt at fleshly manipulation and controlling sin could never do, God did. How? By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Amen. On account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. We can fulfill the righteous requirement of the law. When the law commands us, obey. When we, through faith in Jesus Christ, looking to Christ and his promise, he strengthens us. We not only obey by His grace, but we do, do so with the right heart attitude and joyfully. And so we need to apply God's promise in our battle with sin. I got an email the other day from a brother 
who was, uh, I read the email, but it was like I was with him right there. In the email, he was jumping up and down, rejoicing over the victory he has and the freedom he has in, in uh, terms of his bondage to sin. And he kept quoting Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentile in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Faith in Christ for strength to subdue sin receives fresh grace Fresh, a fresh outpouring of the Spirit. Because Christ paid not only my debt on the cross to forgive me of my sin, but He also paid the price necessary to supply me with regular grace to live in such a way as I am no longer under the dominion of sin. And that's why Galatians says in verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Stand fast in your liberty, my brothers and my sisters. The Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph through Jesus Christ. If you're not a believer, I encourage you today. Oh, I know your spiritual appetite must be aching, must be hungering, must be thirsty, must be craving deliverance once and for all from a lifestyle as a slave of sin. Put your trust in the Lord Jesus to save you. Repent of your sin and trust Him to pluck you from the miry clay. He'll put a white robe of righteousness on you and he'll infuse you with his presence, his spirit, and equip you with the grace and strength you need to live the true Christian life. You won't have to live it alone. And as a believer, we're free. Live as free men. Live as those who are free. Trust in Christ Jesus for grace to say no to sin and to obey him from the heart. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the liberty by which we have been made free, that you have purchased for us on the cross. Oh, help us to remember this truth and get out of our thinking this defeatist mindset when it comes to saying no to sin and yes to God. Help us to remember that you already paid the price. You already secured the victory by your death on the cross. All we need to do is trust you for it, for fresh grace to overcome Help us to remember this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.